turn to Job 1. Normally, I try to keep it a surprise uh, what my text is, but it's in the bulletin. So I can't get away with that. Everybody loves a good story, right? They really do. Uh, we even, someone says, we even think of our lives as a story. You tell somebody about something that happened, you tell it as a story. And uh, we, we, we try to communicate truth with stories, Aesop's fables, obviously. I remember those as a kid and I really enjoyed those. And even as a kid, I remember thinking, hey, I know this is going to have a meaning at the end. What's the meaning going to be? And sometimes you could kind of see it coming and sometimes you, you, you can't. Um, and, and I think that even some of the fairy tales that we have today have, have meanings in them. And that's some of the reason why they're entertaining to us. Uh, but God communicated history, which it is a story, but he communicated it in a story. And often he did that to show how, how he interacts with us, uh, what things that we can see about God that we wouldn't know just by looking at nature. And that's why it's specific revelation. He's revealing things specifically to us. But then there's also, hey, what is it that we don't see about God? What is it that we don't know about God? Things that, that we're just not clear about. And we can see those things in how man interacts with God. It interacts with his circumstances in Scripture. But if you think about Job, what a story. If I didn't tell you that it was the book of Job, but but I told you if, to imagine a story where you had a good guy, but not just any good guys. He's the best good guy anybody knows. And, uh, and there's a bad guy because there's not really a good story without some kind of a conflict. Uh, the antagonist in this story is the baddest bad guy of all bad guys. And uh, the bad guy doesn't like the good guy because the good guy gets attention. And so he says, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy his family. I'm going to take everything that he's got. And, and that's not the end of the story because nobody wants that story, right? Um, but, but through that, the good guy says, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to let this keep me down. And by the end of the story, the good guy wins. That's a, that's a story that even knowing the plot, you want to see that, right? You want to hear that. You want to read that book. That's what Job is, right? I mean, they think about it. That's a classic story and it may be the oldest story. And it's not just a, it's not a fairy tale. It's a reality. And, and I think we can see some of that reality in our lives and, and, it's unfair for us, and this is one of the reasons why God says, don't compare yourselves among yourselves because that's not wise. Because whatever you want to see, you're going to see. If you want to see yourself as, as feeling bad and a reason to be feeling sorry for yourself, well, then you'll find that. If you want to compare yourself and make yourself look good, well, then you're going to find that. But oh, we could compare ourselves to Job and say, well, come on, which of us has gone through anything like that? And, and, and that's not fair to do. And, and in doing so, you could say, well, then I'm not going to get the grace that I need to go through it. No, that's not true. That's not true. But I do believe that God put Job through what he put Job through or allowed Job to go through this so that we can all say that no matter what we go through, there's something there that we can get through it, number one. And number two, that God is always, I mean, this is, I'm not trying to re-preach my message this morning, but it's a great example of that, that God is there, God's got a plan, and that there's probably something that I don't know that I can learn from. And uh, what, a, but what an amazing thing here that Job went through. I, I don't want to imagine losing a child, but to lose all, if you have 10 children, all 10 of your children in one, one day. And then person after person comes to you and says, basically says, everything you've ever had has just been wiped out. All you have left is your life, your health, and your wife. That, that's all you have left. That, how do you respond? How do you respond in the face of that kind of tragedy? Because everybody's going to go through tragedy. Everybody does. It's not just this, this tragedy, but everybody's going to lose a loved one in life. You're going to have a health problem. You're, you're probably going to have a financial crisis. There, there, there are these things. And I don't say that for everybody to feel bad and like, oh, man, life's, you know, but life can be tough. Life can be very difficult. You will be experiencing tragedy at some time in your life. However, tragedy does not define you. How you respond defines you. How you respond to your tragedy will define who you are. Look at Job. And how he responded really set the template for the rest of the book. 
And no, he wasn't correct about everything that he thought about God. But we're going to see what God said about him. So we, we know from the first few verses of the chapter that in God's eyes, he was perfect. He was upright. He feared God and he eschewed evil. He tried to stay away from evil, evil in his life. He didn't want anything to do with it. And he tried to draw close to God. And that in God's words, he was perfect. He was upright. He did what was right in his life. That was his character. And even his, his children had a good relationship that as they had birthdays, as they had events, that they would invite each other over and they just had a good time together. But Job's concern, he was concerned that in that, look, my children, they may not have acted right in this. And, and so Job's concern was for their spiritual well-being. And it wasn't just the birthday parties, okay? It was it was all kinds of things in life because it says, thus, Job, thus did Job continually. Job was consistent in his character, and he was consistent in his spiritual concern for his family. He led them in a right way. He, he sent and he called for them together and said, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sacrifice in case we have done wrong. And he brought them into this situation that, look, this is what we need to be doing as people of God, staying right with him, making sure he was trying to lead them to be perfect, upright, to eschew evil and to fear God. So that's who Job was. But there was a time when the sons of God, these angels, both good and bad, would present themselves before God. And Satan also came before God. And, and the Lord asked him what he was doing as if the Lord didn't know what he was doing. And the Lord does know. But he wants him to give this account of himself to God as one day we will. And he says, uh, have you considered my servant Job? Have you ever noticed that it wasn't Satan that brought Job up to the Lord, but it was the Lord that brought Satan or brought Job up to Satan? Have you considered him that he is perfect, that he is upright, that he fears me and he is choose evil? Look at look at what God is doing. God is proud of his of his servant. He he is happy about this choice servant. Do you know he wants to be that way about you? Why else would Jesus tell us that one day we can hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Because God wants to say that to us and that we can be faithful to him. We can be good. So Job then responds and he says, well, does Job fear God for nothing, for no reason? Because because Satan believes that the only reason Job fears God is because God has blessed Job. He says, look, you've put a hedge around him. You're protecting him. You've blessed him. He, he, had, he was the greatest of all men in the East, which means he was probably the greatest of all men in the world, but definitely top three. We don't know about the West. I don't know that there was a West, but he was, he was that guy. He had all these, these uh, uh, cattle, sheep, camels, etc., and could have multiplied them very quickly. And maybe that's what he did. I don't know. Probably a great landowner if they owned land in those days. But he says, look, the only reason he serves you is because you've blessed him. If those things were taken away from Job, Job would not serve you. He would not bless you. He would curse you. And the Lord says, all right, you have the power to take those things away from him. Only touch not his life. Only touch not his life. And so that it starts the story of how everything was taken away. And at the end of that, you know, you've got to think if you're Job. All this happens back to back to back to back. All this bad news. Tell me you're going to say, well, that's just a coincidence. You're not going to think that. You're going to think, look, this is the hand of God for some reason. This is the hand of God. And I thought it was interesting. It says fire came from heaven. That was their idea. Like, look, look, this is from God. God has done this to you. And that's obviously what his friends thought is, Job, God's doing something to you. But let's listen to Job's response. OK, uh, in, in verse number 20 of Job, chapter one. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Again, verse chapter 2, verse 1, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence camest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going, going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Look at that. After all he's been through, the Lord's like, hey, do you remember Job? It's almost like the Lord's like, I know that you know what's going on. I know that you you went after him. We just discussed this. It's like it's like uh, God's acting like he doesn't remember. Have you considered him? What does he say? That there is, he didn't say the word still, but that has to be the word, right? That he is still none like him in the earth, perfect upright, one that fears God and eschews evil, and he and still he holdeth fast his integrity, though thou movest me against him without to destroy him without cause. So the Lord is saying, look, despite all that you did to him, that's still who he is. And I, and I want to point out two things. Remember I said it's almost as if God has this like sparkle in his eye when he mentions Job, and it's almost like he's saying it like, look, I haven't really thought about Job. Man, what's going on with Job? Oh, by the way, he's still the same guy that he was, even though you said he was going to be different. In fact, he says he holdeth fast his integrity. So we tend to think about Job as having integrity. That's the same exact word that's used when describing Job as perfect. He's held his perfection. Though thou movest me against him without cause is the same word that, that Satan used when he said he serves you for nothing. God told him, you move me against him for nothing. He threw his own words back in Satan's face and said, look, he's still the same guy. Well, what was Job's response? Because if you can go through all of that and still be perfect in God's eyes, and God almost, if he could be more proud of Job, that's where he is. Because when we go through tragedy, then what are we to say? How are we to go through that so that we can get through that like God wants us to and like Job did? And so let's go back and look at that in verse 21. He said, naked came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord take, hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a simple statement. But what is this statement? What is this response to tragedy? It's a response, first of all, of truth, of truth. How often is it when something happens to us that it's almost like all truth that we knew goes out the window? Everything that we said we believed up to that point, it's like, uh oh, you know, uh, good things are only supposed to happen to good people. And so God's word must not be true. I got to find a different path. I got to do something that I've never done before, or I've got to do something that I know really doesn't work, but you know, apparently this didn't work, so I'm going to go do that. We're tempted to run away from what we know to be true. And one of the best things we can do is what Job did, is in the face of that tragedy, you know, keep my feet where, where, where they need to be. Keep Stay on the same path that I've been on if I know that the path that I've been on is the right path. One of the things about this truth that he said, I mean, come on, naked came out of my mother's womb. Yeah, pretty much. Everybody's the same on that. How true that statement is. And naked I'll return. You know what? I can't take anything with me and I didn't bring anything out. And that's exactly what Paul says. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 7, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain, it's true, that we can't take anything out. So what's Job saying is like all this stuff that I had, God gave it to me in the middle, in between that, that beginning and that end. I didn't deserve it. God just gave it to me. I didn't bring it, and I'm not going to take it. So what does it matter if it's gone anyway? That's a true statement. But sometimes we say, well, I deserve. I deserve. And I know we're fed it by commercials and whatnot. Like, I've seen some commercials, and like, you deserve a car. I'm like, I do? <laughs> what did I do to deserve a car? And if I deserve this car, then why aren't you giving it to me? Right? I, I think what they're saying is you worked, you got this money. 
except that they don't really want you to spend real money. They want you to get a loan. They want you to spend money that's not yours, that maybe you will deserve, but you don't right now, right? So this is this trick that we deserve so much more than what we actually deserve. Because what do we deserve? Apart from Christ, we deserve hell. But with Christ... He makes us deserve all these things. And it's not me, it's him. And that's kind of what he's saying is, is it God's grace? And that's the truth that he's focusing on. It's by God's grace that I had any of this anyway. It's you could say, well, somebody says, hey, well, Job's a smart guy. He, he figured it out. You know, he, he figured out how to be a good farmer. And so, and he worked hard because farming's hard. And, and he figured out how to employ people and 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 so it was his his talents and abilities and education and and to intellect that helped him well who gave him talent abilities and intellect god did you don't have anything but it wasn't given to you in the first place so he's focusing on the truth of god's grace in his life that would even allow him to have those things that would even allow him to be alive philippians paul says finally brethren Whatsoever things are true, think on these things. It just seems like a simple thought to think true thoughts. But sometimes when we get into a tragic situation, we panic. And we think thoughts that, that aren't true. Well, what am I going to do if? Well, let's maybe wait till if happens. And so that way, if if doesn't happen, I'm not doing something that I shouldn't be doing. But it's almost like Job took a moment he stepped back and he says, well, hold on here. This stuff that I had that was taken away from me was only a lent to me in the time frame that I was alive. So let's just take that under consideration. Just because bad things happen to me doesn't mean God doesn't love me. We're tempted to blame God. We're tempted to say, well, maybe God's not good. We're tempted to think these things about God and be bitter against God. Like that illustration I gave in the earlier service about that, that Jewish man. He talked about his, his grandmother who was bitter at God because God took her husband away. Who gave her the husband? Right? Who helped him? Who led him to be a good man? Aren't you thankful for the time that you did have and the children and the grandchildren that God gave you through him? But no, you're only focused on the one thing. But that's what we're tempted to do. Isn't that what Satan was trying to get him to do? Was to focus on the negative and blame God for it? He says, if you take this away, he'll curse you. He won't maintain rightness. He'll change. And Job says, I'm not going to change. Truth's truth. I'm sticking with it. Truth doesn't change. I'm sticking with the truth of God's grace but also the truth of God's sovereignty. God's in control. He's not stopped being in control. And I think sometimes people think that, oh, a bad thing happened. God must not be in control anymore. Well, okay, in my life, when, uh, okay, so I uh, I, I was, uh, got out of a radiation treatment and, you know, you're taking chemo pills and so your brain's not quite right anyway. And so I left and I was pulling out and, and you're laying on a table for like 20, 25 minutes. And I don't know about you, but if it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I lay on a table for 20, 25 minutes, I may not go to sleep. But by the time I get up, I'm almost dizzy. You know, I'm just like, I'm in a different world. And so, so a lot of times my eyes would be blurry because I you know, basically have my eyes closed for 25 minutes and I'm pulling out. And the lady in front of me, she, I could see a gap in the traffic coming. And so she pulls forward when this gap comes. And so I look left because the traffic is coming from the left and I let off the brake. Now, I didn't take my foot off of it, but I just kind of let off of it a little bit to kind of creep forward. And when I did, I ran in the back of her and I was like, well, time out. You led me to believe that you were going to leave. I'm trying to blame it on her. OK, <laughs> now my point is this. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. It wasn't God. I made a mistake. But sometimes when things go wrong. We want to say, oh, God's not in control. Because when things go wrong in my life, it's me that wasn't in control. It's me that made a mistake. But God doesn't make mistakes. He's sovereign. Yeah. One of the things Job was uh, was alluding to, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, is that God can do what God wants to do. God doesn't owe me only good things. In fact, in chapter 2, you can look across the page, verse 9, then said his wife unto him, doth 
thou still retain thine integrity? You still going to be perfect? Um, my wife's never said that to me. She said, curse God and die. In other words, look, if you just blame God, God will get rid of you. You won't have to face this pain anymore. If you just curse God, God will take your life. And so a little bit of what she's saying is merciful. But at the same time, Job's like, hold on a minute. I'm not going to do that. That's not right, whether it gets me out of my pain or not. But he said unto her, verse 10, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? This is the best part of this verse. Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? Should we only get good from God? What we think that way, don't we? Oh, I'm, I'm a believer now. So only good things should happen to me in my life. I'm trying to live for him. So God should only bless my life. And he's not saying evil as in wickedness, but he's saying evil as in good or bad. Should only should God only give you good things or what about bad things? Maybe God can use a bad thing for a good, good reason. Maybe God can use as in Exodus chapter 14. Maybe God can use this bad circumstance in your life so that the whole world knows who God is. Twice in Exodus chapter 14, it says so that the Egyptians may know that the Lord is God. God wants the world to know who he is. It's not just about Israel. It was about the Egyptians and everybody else. Look, when they went to uh, Jericho, remember what Rahab said? We know who your God is because we've heard about what he's done. Yeah, God was getting glory out of God using their bad circumstances. And God wants to do the same thing. Look, if a Christian's life is just great, well, sure, who doesn't want to serve that God? But when a Christian's life is bad and that Christian still loves God and still exudes kindness and love and graciousness, who does that? Right? Only Christians. Should be. Because we have someone in our life that's living that through us, regardless of the negativity, regardless of our circumstances. We, of all people, should stand out as different in the negatives. The truth of God's sovereignty. In Job 9, verse 12, Job said, Behold, he taketh away, and who can hinder him? And who can say unto him, What doest thou? This, this reminds me of the, the, the verse that talks about, Can the pot say to the potter, Why makest me thou? But the human being wants to say, God, why have you done this in my life? And maybe God's got a plan and he's just not told me about it. Or maybe God doesn't owe me only good things. And Job is saying, Look, this is just part of the life that God has for me. And, and, and sure, it looks bad and it's not what I wanted, but it's okay because God is in control. God is sovereign. God has the right to do with my life whatever he wants to. There's also the truth of God's goodness. The Lord does give. He doesn't have to give. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is still good regardless of, I mean, you can focus on the fact that he took it away, but you can also say, you know what? He gave it to me in the first place. He gave me the ability to maybe grow these crops, and he gave me the opportunity to do these things. Ability doesn't mean opportunity, and opportunity doesn't mean ability. And even that doesn't mean an outcome that you may like. But Job says, God gave me all those things. God was good to me all along. And even though this looks bad, it might be a good thing. You think about that. This is probably the oldest book in the Bible, not that it means that the events were the first events, because they obviously weren't before Genesis chapter one. But Job's legacy has lived on for, I mean, there's a lot of unbelievers that don't know the Bible, that know about Job, right? God has used the life of Job in people's lives. What an amazing thing that is. And Job, Job at one point said, oh, that, that I could write this with a, a pen of iron, right? That, that it could be etched in stone so that everybody would know. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not iron and it's not stone, but it still lasted that long. God is still using this in people's lives. God is good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He has a plan. I, I read this book about the faith of an American soldier, and it wasn't spe speaking specifically of a Christian faith. But in this book, he talked about the various types of faith that people have, sometimes the Native Americans and sometimes those of other religions. But he said, really, when it when it comes down to 
tragedy in their lives. He said, sometimes you have you have guys who really don't have a religious belief, but they have a moral belief and their moral belief is good things happen to good people. Well, that's kind of what some people, the wrong thinking that covers the book of Job. And they'll go into battle and, hey, they've been trained well. They've got great weapons and they're American soldiers. They go in and they're victorious. They come through. Nobody's hurt. They did exactly what the the, the object was of that operation. And day in and day out, the same good things happen to them. And they think good things happen to good people. And then they go into a battle one day and something doesn't go right. An IED goes off. Their buddy gets shot. People die. Good friends of theirs die. And they say, what in the world? Because now their worldview is completely shattered. Because no longer can they say good things happen to good people. Because sometimes bad things happen to good people. And whether it's that moral thinking or it's some other faith, when somebody dies and they have no idea where they're going, they have no idea of their future, their faith begins to fall apart. But those whose faith is on the word of God and can make sense of this, that even though you're doing the right thing, Sometimes bad things do happen. It's still okay. And that God might have a plan for that. And that they still could have been faithful in their lifetime for what God would have them to do. Sometimes our faith can fall apart because our belief about God is incorrect. Job's three friends, their belief about God was incorrect. So it's a response of truth, but it's also a response of trust. The Lord gives. And the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, when you go into a, a tragedy, I, I read uh, Carrie Schmidt's book called Off Script. And Off Script was his story of when he re- he got diagnosed with, I think it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he said, look, one of the first things we did, we sat down with the family and said, uh, we're still going to trust God. We're still going to love God. And we're still going to live for God. Because that's that's the same attitude that's here. Naked came I in, naked go, I'll leave. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm not changing things. I'm not going to do any different. I'm going to trust God through this. He's always in control. He knows my future. I don't. He doesn't, I don't deserve any of it that he would give me. If he was good in the easy times, he's good in the bad times. Logically, there's really only one path to hope. Uh, I've seen, and you see it all the time. I think at my news feed in this last week, there's at least two famous people that have died. Uh, O.J. Simpson was one of them. And, but that, that doesn't really matter who it was this week because you can go back every month and it seems like somebody famous died. And, you know, one of the first things you ask is, well, why did they die? What, what was it that killed them? And, and, and several years ago, I knew of somebody specifically who had a specific type of very aggressive cancer. And this person was ridiculously wealthy, a lot of connections, and they're still dead. Because it doesn't matter how much money you have. Money won't fix certain things, no matter how much of it there is. Experts that you know, you could have the you could you could have your best friends could be the best doctors for the exact problem that you have, and that's not gonna fix it. Who you know doesn't get you out of certain problems. Who you are does not get you out of certain problems. You can be the smartest person on the planet and figure your way out of every problem, but there's certain things that you just can't get out of. So what hope do you have to provide? What hope do you have for tragedy? When we first got the diagnosis for me, it was like, okay, there's several things that I think of. What about my what about my future? You know, as far as I'm going to be alive, what's that going to look like? Well, I'm pretty settled about my eternity future. That's that's not a concern to me, but we'll get to that. What about my financial future, both in the the, the uh, short term and the long term? Well, what about my family? Right. There's these thoughts that you think, well, what about what about what about? You know, there's nothing I could do. I could see like I'm probably not going to be able to handle any of these things. I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to fix this. What hope do I have? But do you know when Christ is in your life, your future, I don't have to worry about it. You know, we, we talked about this. That God can do anything. 
God can do the impossible. He can change things. He can he can do things that you wouldn't ever guess. You have hope for your own health. You have hope for your your eternal future because of Christ. You can have hope for the present. You can I got health hope. I was like, you know what? I don't care how bad this is going to look. I serve a God that can do anything. That doesn't mean that he will do anything, but it means that he can do anything. That's more hope than any doctor you've got. That's more hope than the best medicine that's out there. Just because they're going to give it to you doesn't mean it's going to work. You don't have that hope except for Christ. What about my family? I said, well, Lord, I said, if I die, what are we going to do? You know, I, I, I'm concerned about how they grow up. I want them to be godly people. I want them to trust God. I want them to walk with God. I want, I want that for them. Forget about the financial part. I want them to be led in the right way. Lord, how's that going to happen? And in like one mental conversation, the Lord was like, okay, if you're alive, whose responsibility is it? Oh, that's my responsibility, right? Well, if you're dead, whose responsibility is it? Well, it's not mine. Right. It's the Lord's responsibility. So the Lord was like, so you think you can do a better job than I can? Like you need to be alive in order for them to live for God. Like that's going to guarantee that they're going to, because it doesn't, right? It doesn't, does it? I cannot guarantee my kids live for God. I am not their hope. And, and, and my hope for them living for God better not rest in me, whether I'm dead or alive. It should rest in him. You know, I thought, okay, well, there's the answer. I, my hope then has to be in him because there is no other hope. But look what our world does, right? Like they're going to go to drugs to help them in times of tragedy. When was the last time that really helped, right? You might forget about it for a little bit, but it's coming back. It doesn't fix it. Alcohol, same thing. It, it might help you forget about it for a little bit, but it's roaring back. And now you've got a bigger problem. Right now, you've got more problems. Oh, what about entertainment? Maybe you can get lost in that and escape in your mind. Does that fix it? No, it doesn't fix it. Money's not going to fix it. The economy's not going to fix it. The, the politics and the presidents and 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 all that—that's not going to fix the problems. But in all those things, we have hope. Where we have hope in Christ. He gives you hope for all that. Man, the Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Keep your trust on him. Job said, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. Though it's God's hand that comes down and says, I'm taking, I'm choking the life right out of you. He's like, okay, okay, I'm still going to trust him. If Job can do it, is Job, how is Job different than you? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. He didn't have a Bible, but yet he said, I'll still trust God. He didn't have the example of another Job. Right. He didn't have anybody to look to other than however God was communicating to him at that time. He said, that's that's where I'm saying. He didn't say something wrong with God's mind here. Well, why am I going through this? He probably said there's something wrong with my mind here. In fact, in Job 23, he's like, I want to talk to the Lord because I know if I talk to the Lord, he'd tell me what's going on. And, and I don't know what's going on. There's something wrong with me here. Not that I did something and that's why I'm in this situation, but I don't understand it. But I know that God does and I'm going to trust him. So how do we do that? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to put yourself in the place of Job where you can trust God like Job trusted God and respond like Job trusted and right, like he responded, then you're going to have to be in God's word so that your faith is in the right place. You know, you can't trust what you don't know. You can't trust what you don't know. That's why we won't step off a cliff onto an invisible step st stairway because we don't see the stairway. We don't know that it's there. But if we knew that it was there, we don't need to see it. Well, faith's a little bit like that. I trust God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is not see that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seeking him. You will not diligently seek God unless you believe that he is and that he rewards you. And then when you seek God, you'll be like Job, and you'll say, okay, this is how this is how we do this. Lord, I don't see you, but I'm going to seek you. I don't know, but I'm going to find out from you. So it's a response of truth. It's a response of trust. And it's a response of submission. It says... In verse 20, at the end, that he fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, naked came out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
Blessed be the name of the, of the Lord. This statement is literally a statement of worship. You say, you say well, Brother Jeremiah, you said it was a, a response of submission. So the word worship, I don't know how we got here. I, I don't know. I wish I could erase it from our minds. But we think of worship as singing or we think of worship as praise. But that's like saying baseball is throwing a ball. You know what I mean? It's so much more than that, right? Or, or like basketball is dribbling. Or soccer is kicking a ball. Like just because you kick a ball doesn't mean you're playing soccer, right? Just because you can dribble a ball doesn't mean you're playing basketball. Just because you praise doesn't mean you're worshiping. And people can praise and not even mean it, right? But that is only like one, one angle on the face of a diamond. There's so much more to that diamond than just that one angle that's been cut. Oh, and that's the same as praise. Praise is just one piece. In fact, praise is like the last thing in a long line of things that is worship. This word worship literally means to bow down as if you're laying on the ground in complete submission. The word, if it's if it's um, in the active sense, like we think, oh, Worship, well, that is active. It's actually not. It's actually in a passive sense. The active word means to trample or to subdue. As a military that is subduing their enemy, and maybe they've got them in a place where the opposing general, the opposing king is in absolute surrender. And so sometimes you see that, and, and, and the man, will, the king will get on his knee before the opposing general or whatever and bow his head. Why? Because he's offering his neck. If you want to take my head off, there's nothing I can do about it. That is absolute submission. And so that active sense would be to trample. I am subduing you to the point where there's, there's not, my feet are on you. I'm, I'm totally controlling you. So worship is the opposite. Worship is saying, Lord, here I am, trample me. I am your doormat. I offer you my head. I offer you my life. I offer you everything. That is worship. And at the end of that, you're praise God. Because in that moment, what are you saying? You're saying, I'm nothing. I, I, I'm absolutely nothing in comparison to who you are. Because you are everything in comparison to me. Where was Job? What was Job's life a picture of? Lord, you have the knowledge. I have none. You have the greatness. I have none. That What I came into this world was nothing, but you gave me something, and that shows your goodness, and you took it away, and that's fine, because I don't, I don't deserve anything, because I deserve to be trampled because of who you are. If you can't see God that way, you don't know God. But when you see God that way, there's only one response. But the person that says, God, why have you done this to me? Really? Really? That, that you would bring God into judgment? Because that's what you've already done. You've already decided that God is wrong. Right? That God is wrong. That he should not have done this. That you, that he should treat you a certain way. Really? He created us. He has the right to do anything he wants to do with us. He's only been gracious enough to give us the free will to submit to him. Wow. Right? And yet we say things like that, and he doesn't just say, well, they're done. <laughs> right? I mean, we have a whole world that's doing that. And as Christians, we should be the last people that do that. Because what did he do? He laid down his life for us. He subdued himself so that he could be trampled by the very people he was dying for. The proper response is the response of submission. Worship is not about me. It's about him. It's about saying, Lord, whatever, whatever you want, you gave, you can take away. Blessed be your name. At the end of it, what do we hear? That's where you hear the praise. God, you're good. And sometimes it takes tragedy in our lives for us to see that 
in ways we've never seen it before. It took Israel going to the Red Sea and facing tragedy. But what did they do? They submitted. They said, okay, we'll do what you want us to do. We'll leave Egypt. We'll, we'll go through the Red Sea. And at the end of it, they were victorious. And Moses had a song. There was praise. We see the, the disciples, right? They're following him. They think they're following him. They think they're everything that they should be. And then tragedy strikes. Their world falls apart because their Messiah is being taken. He's being crucified. They forsake him. All forsook him. They scattered. They left him. I mean, their lives are in pieces. And then here comes the resurrection. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on here? But then the rest of their lives, they lived in submission. They lived in praise. They saw the victory. So sometimes tragedy is brought into our lives so that we can see God in a better way. It's not that we were doing wrong necessarily, but that God wants to take us to another place. And God is telling us through Job, look, this you can't get a better response than Job's response. A response of truth. What do I know to be true? Forget this. What I, hey, there's things apparently I don't know. Those aren't true anymore. But what is something I do know that's true? Go back to that. Think on things that are true. And then trust God for what you know about God. And if you don't know enough about God, you go to his word and say, Lord, show me who you are so that I can trust you and then submit to him. Lord, you've brought this in my life and I will be in it for as long as you have, it, have me in it. I want to learn the lessons you have for me. I trust you. I will submit to you because you are great. You know, it was a while before Job saw the end of this. But his mindset did not change. And you can have that same response. I'm so glad. It's not a complicated response, is it? I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not complicated. Truth, trust, and submission. 